has uh, highlighted uh, the fact that many South Africans are afflicted by the story. We take a look at the situation in the Northwest Province now. Okay, so let's go back to the discussion. As I mentioned earlier on, we're joined by my colleague, Reginald Fitboy, who is a, a reporter in the Northern Cape. Uh, Reginald, you've done quite a lot of these stories, and we will try and hopefully get back our other panelists uh, uh, back. But one of the things that was being said just before we went on the break is how these drug treatment centers are also problematic, that they fail the system, that drugs are sold uh, at these uh, centers. What has been your experience from the people that you've spoken to and is anybody being held to account? Well, Tepiso, I must agree with um, Evangelist Becky who mentioned earlier on that drugs are relatively freely available um, in our communities and that is a fact that we can't um, look away from. It, it is what it is. And the Northern Cape Social Development Department uh, um, admitted that they have a, a challenge when it comes to drug rehabilitation centers in the province, so much so that they need to take um, money from other budgets to invest now in drug rehabilitation centers. And when, 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 when I spoke to uh, um, drug addicts, they, will, they, they told me that it, it is um, freely available and um, when you start using drugs um, as early as 12 years old, 13 years old. We heard the story of El Mondro earlier on mm. and it is our, our communities are at wit's end and although they are trying to report these cases, um, they feel left in the dark because um, police officials or um, other stakeholders are not playing their part enough to combat mm. this scourge of drug abuse in our communities. Mm. To and and Darlene James, just to come back to you, I, I'd just like to know what your experience has been, that of living with a drug addict and uh, the system itself, whether it is working. So... Has there been a point where, you know, your son could have been uh, helped to be sober, but the system failed you? Yes, back then it, it, was, it, was, it was really difficult as someone that didn't have access to information. Now I'm equipped with information and knowledge at least. You know what, when someone said earlier on, you know, one cannot help an addict. The road to recovery starts when someone reaches out and when someone wants help. But I've always asked this question, what happens to the family that has to live in that, in that chaos, in that suffering? What, what does the family have to do? you know, to get help. And luckily, there's another option of, of, of um, treatment which speaks to your involuntary intake. And the involuntary intake basically is to assist mothers like myself, that, you know, where kids are stealing from them and harassing them, you know, to get them, force them into treatment. But then you go to the court, the justice system, and, you know, they, there's, there's no social workers that they can sort of assign to these cases so yes these these all of these plans are available and i see it's in the national drug master plan as well but implementation remains a big problem i heard someone earlier on saying that you know what there's no budget and there's no resources this comes as a surprise to me because when you look at all the provinces annual um, um reports the budget social development is always sending they're always underspending so, so the, the notion where there's no money for programs, I'm not understanding that when money is being sent back. And I also just want to say that my son has been clean for almost five years now and he's done his matric and, and he's doing well. Mm -hmm. That's some great news. But I, I think it's a very pivotal point that you raised. It said that um, as a country, we lose as much as three 37.9 billion rand annually as a result of drug abuse. So let's hear then from social development. Why is there um, underspending and why resources are there? Ms. Mahangwa? Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
there, there, there are many re- problems or reasons why uh, maybe, you know, uh, provinces as well as the local structures are not able to respond appropriately to issues of, uh, of, of drug abuse. Uh, it's not only the budget, but it's also the issue of capacity building. Substance abuse is a highly specialized mm-hmm. area. And social, not an ordinary social worker can do. A social worker that is doing it, she must have been trained so that you understand that you are dealing with an, an, an illness, you are dealing with a multifaceted problem that does not only manifest in terms of the behavior, but there's a, there's, a, there's a psychological part to it, there's a behavioral part to it, there's a mental part to it, there's also a physical part to it. So therefore, training, training, training is quite critical. Mm. I don't think and it if, answers um, the question though, because I think it's important that you mention the multidisciplinary approach, which is now that you said is encompassed in the National Drug Master Plan now. But in the past, mm. uh, as you've heard there uh, from Ms. James, that there is underspending it, the money is there. So how do you account for that? If uh, yeah, let, you didn't... Yeah, let, me, let me, yeah, I was still coming to that. The second issue is the issue of budgeting. Remember, budgeting, you budget for different levels of intervention. There's a, a lot of budget that we have. It's a budget that is, is, is there to deal with the treatment. There's very little budget on prevention. And therefore, because of that, it creates some challenges in terms of making sure that you reach out to as many youth or as many people as you can so that you prevent them from really becoming addicted mm-hmm. to substances. You spend 80% of your budget dealing with that issue, which, as we are saying, that you may, it does not mean that when I go through a treatment program today, I will be able to be, uh, I, there's, there's guarantee that I will not go back to uh, 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 issues of substances. So those are some of the challenges that we are really looking at. The issue of, uh, when, I, when I was talking about under-budgeted, I was talking under the issue of prevention, that prevention is not properly you know, allocated with, with, with funds. More funds are under prevention. A lot of money goes to treatment centers. A lot of money goes to... Well, let's hear from Dr. Begil and Sainé. Would you agree with prevention. that perspective? Um, you know, Tabitha, you remember with Sanka, we are also uh, subsidized, you know, by social development. And I think our challenges at Sanka will be different from maybe rather other organizations. I just want to come in there to say from our side, when it comes to the funding that we receive, we also have to raise more funding from our side mm-hmm. as Sanka so that we are able to reach, you know, the capacity of people that we need to reach in terms of prevention, because we run an inpatient, outpatient, and also a community-based kind of services that we offer. So each and every services that we offer, we need to make sure that whatever we do, we are able to reach out to more people than ever before. So I cannot answer specifically on what Tisa is actually specifically saying, but I know that in terms of funding, uh, it is also minimum, you know, from our side. Hence, I say we need to seek other revenue. Okay, we'll hear from the other panelists in just a moment, but perhaps it's it's worth asking um, the person who's been most affected by this begging Miende, let's talk about um, when you are a drug user, was there any evidence that there is state funding being made available not only for prevention, for treatment, especially access to it? When you knew that you had a problem and you wanted to quit, was there support? Uh, no. Okay, so this, uh, there was no support. You see, I'm in Gauteng and uh, 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 there's, uh, let me speak about only for city of Johannesburg. There's no rehab in the city of Johannesburg. We only have rehab in Para. Let's only take 20 people. And in Soweto, we have 56 locations. So the rehab in Mohali City, the one life recovery is Mohali City. And, uh, and the one in Prakpan mm-hmm. is Etswane. I mean, it's, it's, it's Ekurulin. And the one in Kalinel. Is that one is it's funny. So in city of Johannesburg, we only have this one rehab in Para, only take 20 people. And the program is two months. Two months, you see, when you only 20 people. And we have ladies who smoke drugs. And they are smoking their money, the money for Sasa. They are selling their, their, their prostitute because they want to smoke drugs. So we are facing those things. Me, I, I, I never go to rehab. I just go to church. And then I accept Jesus Christ. In those days, it was so hard. 
mm. because I was so drunk and go to church and go to the process of the church. Only the church was helping me to, 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 to stop drugs. But I took people to rehabs since 2014. I think Sister uh, Tembegile knows because she was a facility manager in LRC those years. Mm. It was on 2015. Uh, in that year, I took almost 139 people to rehabs. And then I never get the funding since today. Until today, I never get the funding. I just support these guys. I go to the street. I take the guys to the rehab using my money because I'm selling uh, clothes. Sometimes the church uh, give me that 1,000, and then I manage to take those three, four people. Uh, every week on Wednesday, there's an ad meeting rehabs. We only take uh, five people now because of this corona. But I never get the funding. And... I, I love what I'm doing because I'm an extra addict. I, 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 I love what I'm doing. I, I think when you're giving me money, you, it's a pantsella. But I, I, I love to see people change. Do you and think see if people... government gave you money and other uh, private treatment facilities or activists, uh, 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 Ms. James will come to you as well, would it help you as part of those uh, preventative measures that we say we want to take as a country? Yes, 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 because we need the center, skill development locations, especially in Eldorado Park. Dylan can tell you, and in Soweto, Deep Cloth, when you count Orlando, you count uh, all those locations. These guys, when they are coming out of rehabs, they're still coming to the same situation where they are selling drugs. Now we want to do something that is going to take them to another place. And then I spoke to another Baba in Northwest, uh, Mr. Zigalala, is taking people to, to my organization now. Uh, to do farming there and uh, 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 it's only taking 10 people a month so they are coming back to smoke drugs because they are coming to the same situation i think it's like we are rounding the circle doing the same thing again and again because we took these people to rehab we change people to rehabs now because in, in lrc they cannot take you when you're coming for the second time to the rehab so, so, Jan, i'd like to hear from you hello? so uh, yes uh, uh I'm, I'm moving on to kosi jani now and i I want to hear from you. I know you were still to expand earlier on on the treatment centers and how they're complicit themselves in the drug problem we have in South Africa. So please go ahead and finish that train of thought. But I also want to talk about preventative measures. Is there a, in a diagnostic approach that there are underlying causes why somebody is either drug user susceptible to that and is there also money allocated for those kind of treatment approaches if we're saying there's still not enough money or there is underspending and it's because there are so many things that we're doing that we have to make sure that the money is channeled in the right direction oh, that's a that's a huge um, question Sepiso. so firstly I, I just want to say that it is it, it is not something I speak on with authority as far as uh, the mm. complicity of rehabilitation centers. It is something that I have seen in a documentary where unfortunately we lived we live in a very monetized world and people are out there trying to make a buck at any expense. So mm. people that work in drug rehabilitation centers know that those people are desperate. They are going through withdrawal, which is very difficult, and they will do anything. And so therefore they exploit that um, mm. to make money for themselves. And again, uh, you know, as Upegi was saying a little bit earlier on, it becomes a vicious cycle because the very people you are entrusting uh, with helping you become complicit in the problem. And if, if you can't go to a rehab center or if you have failed at the rehab center, you're sabotaged at a rehab center. Where else do you go? You know, mm. so 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 I'll I'll park that for now because it's not an an area that mm. I have any more expertise than I have I have just articulated. Yes. But I think the second question speaks to, uh, you know, how do we how do we identify? Uh, and and the simple answer is it's a piece of that anybody is a potential user, so mm. there isn't anything special. What we can do is that we know, for example, that we can look at the picture in terms of what predisposes people across the age <laughs> to getting mm. in those sorts of situations. And I think I can tell us you know, a, a bit more about that. And I'm, I'm of the opinion that people who have the lived experience of this are better than us who theorize about it. And mm. I, I really wish that in this discussion today we could have had Terelin's son because now when you say your son is, has been uh, drug-free for five years, has completed matric, 
it would be important for us to learn from those people uh, because they have the lived ex- experience of what predisposed them, what led them into going into. And the unfortunate thing is that there is no one size fits all here. Because if we say, for example, it's about rejection, many of us experience rejection, but we don't go that route. Mm. You know, so, so the question so is why. Case, Reginald, yeah, what, what, what are you finding? Yes, Geraldine, I'll come to you in just a moment. I just want to hear from you, Reginald, when you do what you do and you speak to people who are either affected by living with a drug abuser or those drug abusers, what do you find is the common reason? I mentioned earlier on that a colleague who did a story for us in the Northwest Province, one of the interviews views was saying that it was out of boredom. What are you finding when you do your stories? What I find, it's a piece, so, and yesterday when I went out is, I mentioned it earlier on, drugs are freely available. And also, um, drug addicts um, told me that it's the rejection, like other panelists mentioned mm. earlier on, so those are the the, the, the common um, problems, and but but also Almondro said that it, it starts with yourself. So you need to take the leap of faith and to take that bold step and to to to, to say to yourself, well. I am going to make a change. I want to see change in my life. And only then um, others can assist you um, to the, um, on the road to recovery. Mm. Uh, Daryl, so. yes. Uh, sorry, Tepiso. I just wanted to please add on what uh, Sis Kosi was actually talking about. You asked a question about how do we get to assess, maybe rather, if I could use the term. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Currently now, because substance abuse is no longer just substance abuse, it is now classified under DSM-5, which is now called substance use disorder. And under that particular criteria, there's 11 criteria that we currently now use. Someone earlier here in the panel list also mentioned that in this particular field, it is a specialized field. So indeed, we do need trained professionals or rather trained counselors who are able to actually assess. And when we assess out of that 11 criteria, it actually gives us a clear indication of how to assist this particular person, whether they should go for inpatient program, outpatient program, or rather, for example, like what Becky said, some people don't actually get help only from rehabilitation. Some get help from churches, yes, some from NA or AA. And again, lastly, just to add on to what, when we do the assessment, we actually also need to look at the different stage of change the person is currently at. There's five different stages, starting from pre-contemplation to contemplation and so forth. So we need to be able, before anyone can actually go into rehab, what stage of change is that particular person? What kind of mindset are they at? Even after rehabilitation, what stage of change we need to also assess again to actually see, is this person actually ready to be integrated? it back into the family, into the community, so that we are able to see whether this person actually, it won't be a vicious circle that every time a person needs to go back to have over five times to ten times, All because right. that's been the reality of South Africa. Daryline James, what has been your experience, um, especially those different uh, phases of change? I was unaware of it, but you are saying that doing the work you do now, that you are better empowered because you have knowledge, but when you were going through what you were going through with your son, did either of you Uh, know that there are different stages of change and were you uh, able to do something about it? No, I was so oblivious to everything. I just thought that, you know what, if I'm going to send him to a rehab or to a hospital, that will be the end of my problems. I needed to know at what stage of his addiction he was at. Is he just using? Is he abusing? Is he misusing? Or if mm-hmm. he's at dependency stage? You know, sometimes our kids just start using a, a, a dacha and already we remove them from education and we put them into a rehab center. And because that rehab center wants 30,000 rand from the mother and they exploit us and we pay 30,000 rand, we pay 20,000 rand and we actually expose our children to so much more and we don't realize that they weren't ready to for them. 
that type of treatment. And I agree what the, the, the previous speaker said, you know, one needs to assess and find out at which stage of addiction the person is and also put the various options on the table for the person and say, you know what, there's not only inpatient, there's outpatient, there's various options and means of, of recovery and of dealing with this problem. I, I also want to go back to the fact of, you know what, um, dealing with substance, it's not just about, you know, the, the, the resources, the, the budget, but I, and, and we've said that we need to obviously train people and capacitate communities so that we can have these intervention programs and we can have these uh, prevention programs on the ground. But if you look at 2018, 2019 budget, uh, uh, social development underspent by 19 million, surely we could have sort of allocated these funds into training and capacitating uh, on the ground, I mean, the very people like like Becky over there, like my son, and equip them with the finest skill and tools so that they can sort of be the voices and the soldiers that goes out there and creates recovery capital within communities. And, and tell me something, uh, Ms. James. I want to talk about stigma, uh, and I know Kosi Jenny asked earlier on that it, w it would be good to hear from you, and she wishes your son was there to find out from him why he got into drugs. What was his point of view? Has you had this discussion about drug use and uh, was there a, a negative stigma to it? Or uh, as uh, Begimian was saying earlier on, that it's become a fashion, so something almost to uh, be congratulated on doing. What was your son's uh, thoughts and interaction with drugs before and after? You, you know what, like when, when I sat him down and I asked him, boy, why did you do this? Why did you go into it? And like the, uh, uh, I think it was Corsi that mentioned, there's no blanket approach that we can have with this and say this is the reason why. You know, the things he mentioned to me, I didn't even think that that would impact him. He mentioned something like um, we move from a suburb back to a township. He moved to your Model C school. He didn't fit in. He moved things like, you know what, he was thin, he was small, built, he was lead at school and he needed to put in he needed to be with the guys and in order for him to be recognized by the older boys he started selling cigarettes at school for them eventually i think they all at bunk school one day and everyone had ciders and he didn't even know what it would do and just because of the pressure and wanting to fit in this new culture you know in our communities he then had his first he's had his first um, um try i think it was took back then mm. and he didn't even know what he was really getting himself into uh, many people that start drugs it's not no i want to become a drug addict you know it just it just leads you before you know it you lose control over everything in your life and in your family and then when you're in that hole in that whirlwind you you sort of almost cannot come out because of society's projections on you you were druggy you're a drug addict you're dirty your mother's useless you know all of those things it's so much to deal with so, so the education, the platform is so, so, so broad. And we, like I'm saying, I, I, I loved it when the previous speaker said, you know what, it's not a blanket approach. We need to capacitate with the important tools for placement. But then there are also just these ordinary conversations that we need to have with parents, that we need to have with communities on, on how to identify if your child is using. You know, he's sitting in his bedroom. He's not making contact with the family because his eyes are red because of the weed that he's smoking. He's a, a, a one fingernail. He's long. Mm. It's just so much that we need to unpack, and I know time is against us. Mm. No, that's that's fine, and I, I will give all of you a, a quick final word, but I need to come back to you, my friend, how would you then better capacitate yourselves as social development? You, you've mentioned that you now have a multidisciplinary departmental approach beyond just using scientific or medical interventions. How do you better capacitate people like Deraline, people like Beggy, to help in the fight against? Uh, drugs, illicit drugs, trafficking and drug use? I think first thing for us was to standardize treatment programs and also uh, set up protocols in place and then train people on those because if we don't have standardized uh, protocols and treatment programs, it becomes difficult for you to even evaluate and check if whether you're making an impact or not. And then secondly, we've also liaised with United States 
uh, to actually help us to be part, to form part of the programs that they are currently doing, especially when it comes to capacity building. So they have managed to assist us with their training. We have trained plus minus 300 social workers across the country with uh, at different levels and that helps us we write an international uh, exam and it does help a lot in terms of really uh, you know making sure that uh, we've got standards in place and when we, we've got different uh, treatment regime that has really helped and i also want to say one of the things that was to also begin to reinvest in families. We realized that when we do intervene, most of, not only us as department, even non-profit organization, when we intervene as a sector, we focus more on the person that is addicted and left the family behind. Mm. There's not much that we do for families. And uh, families are wounded. Families are in crisis. Families are distressed. Families are, are, are hurt. So they need healing. There's a, they, they need therapy themselves so that, one, they are able to assist and sustain the, at, uh, this particular individual is coming with a call. The, so that they are able not to serve as triggers when they are dealing okay. with issues of, of, of drug abuse. Right. So those are the things that we are learning and taking them to practice. All right. Just uh, very finally, uh, uh, Rachel, in 30 seconds, what could we as the media, uh, as uh, human beings in society, do better to help uh, end the scourge of drug abuse? So uh, many, um, uh, many said earlier on that um, there's somehow this kind of stigma and families are going through the stress and there's just not enough support that's been given to them. And I think we as the media, because there's a lack of um, storytelling to, to get these stories across okay. of drug abuse, our community All so right. we need to amplify it more Darren james and your 30 seconds uh, what can we do better i think t today was international day against drug abuse and illicit drug trafficking i would have loved to see south africans wear yellow ribbon to break the silence and stigma against substance abuse and to become active citizens in mm. participating in the way forward all right begging me and in your 30 seconds what can we do better no, they just need love. Those guys were uh, smoking drugs. We only need love. People, they reject us. They call us names. They say all these things. Mm -hmm. We boys. We don't. You, you see, we end up living under the bridges. But we want to tell South Africa today, we need love. All right. We, Thank we, we, we are tired of people who are calling us names. Kosi Gianni, in your 30 seconds. My 30 seconds, I would like to say, I think one of the things we need to do is to be direct in how we speak about this. One of the things that troubles me is when we say substance abuse. There is no such thing really in the ultimate as substance abuse. You cannot abuse a substance. It is self-abuse. And the minute we focus on what Absolutely. it's doing to the person rather than the substance, you can't abuse chemicals. Mm. I think, and, and let's go directly to the issue. That's a very apt and powerful ending statement. Uh, very true. Tembe Gilem Sani, would you like to add to that? Absolutely. I think uh, the most important thing is we go back to a person's self-identity and looking at one's own self-values to say, you know, who am I? And to be able to understand that as families, let us also be a listening ear even more to what Darlene has actually said and actually continue to educate ourselves more about this particular relapsing disease. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have run out of time. I know, Siza Mahangwe, I uh, came to you last, so I hope you understand that you had your 30 seconds. Siza Mahangwe is the Director General, Chief Director General of Alcohol and Substance Abuse in the Department of Social Development. Thanks to my uh, other panelists, Reginald Vitpo, SABC reporter, Darlene James, social and drug activist evangelist, uh, Peggy Miende, who is a former drug abuser. Thank you, Kosi Gianni, clinical psychologist. Teme Gilem Sani is national spokesperson for the South African Council of Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Uh, that's our discussion today on this International Day Against Drug abuse and illicit trafficking. I hope it uh, gave you a better perspective, different perspective on what we're fighting when we talk about this, uh, what are the danger spots and what we as a society can do. We're going to be back uh, right after this. We're taking a moment.